The question I want us to think about today is how linked are links? So these two links, if you had to give a number to how linked they are, you would say they're not linked, right? Like these components of this link are not linked together. So linking zero, the number would give is zero. So if you want to say it links together once, well, that would probably look something like this. It just goes through it once. What would it look like to link through it twice? Well, instead of just linking around once, you might think it links around two times. So there you go. And now you can see how this link links with him twice. You can round it out, you can really see it. It goes around it twice. So, and we can continue in that way, right? We could, we could make it link around it a third time. And, and the fourth time, and et cetera. So now the link three times, you could do it four times, five times, however many times you want. So now these links are linked three times. Um, so that's pretty easy to see. But what's more challenging is, you know, maybe you have some, some link where the components are knotted up in some complicated way. Maybe this component is like a trifoil or something, and maybe the other one, you know, comes and links and weaves in and out and between the components in some complicated way. And then maybe it would be more difficult to, you know, this one could weave through here in some complicated way. And then it's maybe not so obvious uh, how, how linked are these components. You know, it's maybe much less obvious now. So we want to develop a system for counting how linked components of a link are. So let's do it. Whatever system we develop, we want to keep this intuition that if your two components are, say, this component and this component, we want to say it's linked once. We want to keep the intuition that if it's, say, this component and uh, this component, then it's linked twice etc. And we want to say these are linked zero times. So when we count the linking, we want to say this is linked, this has linking zero, this has something like linking one, and we want to have some idea that this has linking two. So based off that intuition, how might we count that linking? Well, one way you might do it is you might just count, well, notice here orange passes over white once and then goes back under. Here orange passes over white two times. And so you might count the linking. So here's, here's method one. You would just sum up the number of times when orange passes over the white. Problem though, if that's your method, you get into a problem because what if you have something like this? That's right, this is equivalent to the ones that are not linked. And so this should have linking zero, but if we're just summing up the number of times orange passes over white, you would get two. Right? That's not right. So maybe we need to be a little more careful in how we do this count. And so you go, well, this is kind of different than this situation here, because here orange passes over, and then it passes over again. Whereas here I pass over, but then I pass back. So somehow orientations matter. So I should keep track of orientation information. And so maybe I would say something like, if I orient my links, and I have orange passing over this direction, over my white, then I'll give it a, a plus one. And if I have orange passing over the opposite direction, then I'd give it 
uh, minus one. So you can go and you can count. So for instance, you would uh, look here and you would say, okay, here I get a plus one. Here I get a plus one, assuming that this is oriented like this. And so I get a linking number of two. Um, here, if I orient like this, I get a linking number of just plus one, so a linking number of one, and here I still have a linking number of zero. So this seems to be the right thing. Um, we could do a more complicated link, just to kind of see what happens. What if we take a link like, like this one? Now, how linked are the white and orange component? Well, again, we can give it some orientation. Give white some orientation. Let's count. Where does orange pass over white? Well, there's two places where it happens, here and here. And there's right location. Orange passes over white, and it does so in this fashion. So it gets a plus one. Here, orange passes over white, but, but notice the, the white's now going the opposite direction. So actually in this, this setting. So this first one, this is a, this is a right hand situation. We use the simple right hand rule, because if you point your thumb in the direction of the orange, then your fingers curl in the direction of white. Here, it's no longer going in the right-handed right direction. The right hand's going the opposite. It's now going in the left-handed direction. So, so this is left-handed. So that's a quick convention to tell if it's plus one or minus one. Here, if you put your thumb in the direction of orange, your fingers are going against the white. So it's not right-handed, it's left-handed, so that's a minus one. So what's the overall linking of this guy? Zero. Yeah, zero. So we'd say that this has linking zero. Which is kind of funny, because you look at it, and you go, well, they kind of are linked together. Right? It seems like the orange is trapped in the white. You can think about it if you can move around and free the orange. It seems like they're kind of trapped. And yet, in some way, this doesn't record that, right? So that means that you could, like, technically just take it out no, no, we're not claiming that if you're linking number zero, you can move to this. That's not the claim. Um, we're simply saying that the information on linking the number uh, doesn't necessarily, it's not powerful enough to distinguish these. These both have linking zero. Oh, you want to look at the Bohemian rings. Excellent. So if you look at the Bohemian rings, you need uh, three colors. So let me introduce blue. So let's, uh, one way to draw them is you begin by drawing a trefoil. And then you just complete your trefoil. So um, he was over, so he should be over as well. Orange was over blue, so orange should be over blue. And white is under, but over the orange. So there's the Bermian rings. And, and now while we're doing linking, we should limit our attention to two of them. So now we probably need some notation. So I'm going to introduce some notation. Let me call this first component, uh, component one, link component one. I'll call this second one, link component two. One, link component three. Then we'll call the linking between component one and component two. We'll call that the linking number between L1 and L2. And if you just look at L1 and L2, well, what's the, what's the linking between them? Zero. Yeah, it's zero. Like either one, you could look like white goes over both times or orange goes under both times. So that's zero. Similarly, you could look at the linking between L2 and L3. 
So that's between the white and blue component. And notice white goes under both times, or blue goes over both times. But, but in opposite... So that one's zero. And similarly, the linking between L1 and L3 is L1 and L3 is zero as well. So, yeah, just because you can have linking between components zero, you can still have some higher order linking. And I'm hoping that maybe um, by the end of this lecture, next lecture, we can kind of hint at with a higher order linking how to measure it. Okay. Good. So, so here's one way to measure linking. You just count how many times it goes over and how many times it goes under. Uh, the problem is, in order to define linking this way, you have to keep track of like which one is orange and which one's yellow. I mean, which one's orange and which one's white. Right? Like you look at this component and notice like we only paid attention to like this setting when orange was going over the white and this setting when orange was going over the white. But we didn't look at when orange goes under the white, or when this orange one goes under that white one. And, and you might be like, well, what, what would have happened if we did look at those as well? You know, you could do a similar right-hand rule. And you might go, well, if I look at when orange goes under the white, then if you look at the orientation, is it right-handed? Yeah, orange is, agrees with the right hand. So you would put a, a plus one there as well. So it wouldn't just be a single plus one, but you'd get two plus ones. And if I was to put a, when I go under, if I was to put a plus one there as well, so as I go under, that gives me another plus one, it would double my linking. So it's like, you probably don't want to do that. Or if you do do that, the second way to look at linking is you sum up all crossings so so any any crossings using your right hand rule and this would be going this way so this is a plus one because it agrees with my right hand oh no that's a minus one it, it disagrees with my right hand and this is a plus one. So I sum up over all crossings. But then I get doubles. They come in pairs. I go over, I get plus one. I go under, I get another plus one. So what I do is I sum up over all crossings. Then divide the total by two. So, so let's look at a, maybe a complicated link and, and do it. So um, let's say one component maybe is trying to be some kind of uh, figure eight. So something like, something like this. And then maybe you have a second component that comes over and, and maybe we'll make it a little more interesting. We'll say he goes over here and under this one. Yeah, I think this is one that just by looking at it is not entirely obvious what the, the linking number is. And so we should use our, this definition. You look at all crossings between the two links, between the two components. So we'll look at this crossing, this crossing, this crossing, and this crossing. Well, in order to calculate this, I need to give them some orientation. So I give this component some orientation. And I'm going to give the other one some orientation. And let's check the crossings. At this crossing, you get a plus one and minus one. Minus one. Yeah, it's, uh, it disagrees with my right hand. So I get a minus one. How about this crossing down here? Yeah, it disagrees, so it's a minus one. How about this crossing? Uh, I think that's a minus one as well. And this crossing right here? Yeah, that's also a minus one. So you'd say your linking number between, if I don't know, I'll call this component K and this component J, between K 
and j comes out to be half of negative 4, the sum of those, which is negative 2. Uh, so you can put your thumb either direction. Like If you put your thumb on this white strand, then notice your fingers curl under and go against the, the orange. Or if you put your thumb on the bottom, then your fingers curl up and go against the white. So either way, however you use your right hand. So I got negative 2. Okay, here I got a negative. That was kind of strange. Why is it negative here? What if I had picked a different orientation? How would that change the game? Would it? Could you choose one orientation apart from another? Or are they specifically? Yeah, let's think about if I have some, some linking. So here's my proposition. What happens if I change change the orientation uh, on some component k to its opposite, to minus k? So say that this was my, my k previously, and the other guy was oriented like this, and I switch k to go the other direction, the opposite orientation. What happens right here? What was the linking number here previously? Minus one. And what, uh, let's see, yep, that's, uh, that's minus one, that's right. And what does it become now? Because if my thumb is going up in the white, then the, it now orange degrees with my fingers, so it's plus one. So notice changing the orientation from k to minus k changes the sign of your crossings. So you could say the linking number between minus k and j would be negative the linking number between k and j. So up to orientation, these are well defined up to sign. If I had changed the orientation on one of these guys, it would have ch um, changed it from negative 2 to positive 2. What if I changed the orientation on both k and j? I flip both the direction of k and j. Yeah, it would, it would flip twice, and so it would be negative negative, which is regular, the regular linking number between k and j. So, um, it's, uh, you could say, I guess, linking number is defined up to sign depending on your choice of orientation. So you might calculate the number, uh, linking number for some link, and maybe you would get two and your friend would get negative two, and it might just be because you picked one of your orientations being opposite. Okay. Well, those are two ways to define a linking number. Um, but, you know, those are, that's like how you probably like, practice it in life. Right? But there are more interesting ways we can calculate linking number. So here's a third way that you might want to calculate the linking number. And this is a, a perspective using cipher surfaces. So this is like maybe a more uh, surface perspective. Previously, when we had some, like these links over here, we had some, some white component, and then this orange one came through, and he passed through, and then he came through again. You can think of this white guy, this white component, as bounding a disk. And then what orange is doing is it's coming through and it's passing through the disk. And it hits the disk and it passes through once, and then it hits the disk and it passes through again. And so it hits the disk and passes through twice. Which corresponds with the linking number being 2. How about in this other example we had? When we had this other example, now we have this orange guy bound some disk. You have this white component that comes through, passes through the disk, and then passes through in the opposite way to give us um, this link. And here, so you hit the disk once, 
but then you hit through the opposite direction. So you might want to define linking numbering. You could say, um, let k bound some cipher surface sigma. And then with the linking number between k and j is going to do, it's going to be some kind of count the times j passes through sigma. Except here we want to say each time it pass through, it passes through in the same way. So those are like plus one. But here when you pass through, they pass through in different ways, like plus one and minus one. And so it doesn't need to be a count, it needs to be some kind of sign count, where you say your surface, whatever your surface is, has like two sides to it, like a top side and a bottom side. And if your um, link is going from the negative side to the positive side, we'll say that gives it a plus one. But when it goes from the positive side to the negative side, that gives it a minus one. Remember our surfaces are, are orientable. So since it's orientable, so since the surface is orientable, it has a top, which I'm denoting by the plus side, and it has a bottom, which I'm denoting by the minus side. Yeah. Which one? This complicated thing over here? The one that doesn't have an easy surface to look at. Oh, well, let's go look at this one really fast. So with this one, I totally can, but I wouldn't pick the surface of the white guy, I'd pick the surface of the orange guy. Right, the, the orange surface is just this disk, right? And notice what happens. This white guy goes around and passes through. It passes through the disk right there one time. And now it's, well, I need some convention for what is going to be the top and what's going to be the bottom. And so my convention is going to be that when I go around, I orient around my surface, my surface is to my left hand. So, so I orient such that I, I, I orient um, counterclockwise. I'm going to orient counterclockwise about the surface, which is, which is what I have here. It's oriented counterclockwise around the surface, so it should agree with our final answer of negative two. Let's check. Here I pass from the positive side to the negative side. And so we said that corresponds to a minus one. So let me, let me put that right there. That, that's a, that's a, a minus one, because I'm going from the positive side to the negative side. Now I'm under the surface. I'm still under the surface. I'm under the surface until here I pop my head back up and I pass again from the positive side to the negative side. That happens right here, passing from the positive side of the surface to the bottom to the negative side which gives me another negative one. And then I do all this nodding under the surface until I get back to where I started. So I had a contribution of negative one and negative one from these two points that pierce the surface. Cool. So this cipher surface view is a third way that we might think about linking. Okay. There's two more ways I want to show you. And this is where things start to get wild. Here we go. So, so, so far these are all equivalent. You know, as we've been talking, you can, you can tell that these are all equivalent definitions. Here's, here's a fourth one. Okay, let's use some of the machinery we built up the last few lectures. Let's give a fundamental group perspective. So here's the fourth definition of linking numbering. So this would be my 
a fundamental group perspective. Per per <laughs> perspective. Very good. So let's begin with some some not. Okay. And then remember that in the, here's, here's my K, so I can describe, you know, uh, the fundamental group of the complement of K is my pi one of R three minus K. And notice any any other component I might pick is depicted as some word in here, right? So so any other link. So 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 you know, remember K. How how do we how do we describe this pi one? Well, we say that pi one is generated by some, let me give some orientation. And then we picked under each arc, we gave it some like x1, some x2, and some x3, where, where this x1 is a shorthand for the loop that starts off from some base point and goes under and back, right? That's what that x1 represents. So this pi1 is represented by some x1, x2, x3. And then there were some relations. Each of these crossings gave rise to some relation. So I'll just call it relation 1, relation 2, and relation 3. We have some, some well, relation 1 is some relationship between the x1, x2, and x3. Okay, et cetera. And so if I pick any, any other element, um, I guess yellow can pop sufficiently, then, then that can be depicted by some word. You know, I could like, like here's one, I'll just, I'll go under this, I'll do a, an x1. So, so this is the word x1. And then I'll do another x1. So I go under and I do another x1. So now it's x1 squared. And then I'll go and I'll do an x2. And I'll do x2. And then maybe I want to come over here and I'll do x3 backwards. So that's x3 inverse. And I come back like that. So um, any other uh, not? So if this is j, you know, you can, you can represent j by a word where this is some element of your fundamental group. Okay. But, but notice what this word is really saying. What this x1 is saying is that this x1 squared is saying like, I'd link with this part of the knot twice. You know, th this part says, I link twice. And then the x2 is saying, then I link another time. Link, you know, one more time. And then the x3 inverse is saying, well, then I, then I just kind of go the opposite direction, which is like on linking, right? Because I'm going the opposite direction. So sticking with that previous uh, notation. So I, I link like minus one times. So how does this turn into some kind of linking information? Well, if that's your word, what's your linking information? Can you just add the exponents? That's right. It's just saying link twice, link once more, and then link minus one times. So that would say you have total linking linking two. And that's exactly agrees like definitions one and two, where you're just counting the number of times that you know you go under and over and under and over, and you just count those number of times, and it'll give you the, that result. So we might say definition four for linking number is the linking number between um, have we been doing JK or KJ? Between K and J is well to figure that out, it's the sum of the exponents uh, 
in the word representing j in pi 1 of r3 of k. So that was connecting it back to a fundamental group definition. And, and you could do it vice versa. You could, uh, well, you should convince yourself that if you switch j and k in the previous definitions, nothing changes. If, if I switch these, it's still right-handed. And so you should convince yourself, so note, The linking number between j and k is the same thing as the linking number between k and j. And so you could also think about this as looking at the fundamental group of the complement of j, and then looking at what word k gives you. So it's equivalent. OK. Um, I, can, I can formalize this a little bit more, and maybe, maybe um, convince you even more so this is true. I think, I think it's sufficient. But there's another way to think about it. Where do these relations come from? So, um, in our, this, is, this was a Wittinger presentation for the, the knot group. The knot group has relations. Well, how did we get these? Looking at the crossing. That's right. You looked at a crossing. And if this was some like ith component, maybe this is some kth component, this is some ith plus one component, then you would have your xi, you would have here xi plus one, and here you'd have xk and xk. That gave us the relation that you could do these two, which would give you a loop around the diagonal, which is the same as doing these two. So xk xi equals xi plus 1 xk. Notice, the reason this is interesting is because like, these elements are not commutative. We talked about how these are not commutative groups in general. For the, uh, for the unknotted is, but otherwise, generally these are not abelian groups. So, so our group pi 1 of r3 minus k is generally, generally it's not abelian. But what if we forced it to be abelian? What if I said, I'm, instead of looking at this group, I'm going to look at this group, but I'm going to let everything commute. So you let everything commute. Then I might call that something like the abelianization of pi 1 of r3 minus k. What would that look like? Well, let's think what would happen to this relationship if we let everything commute. Once we abelianize, abelianizing, well, now you can change the order of things. So now you get that xk, xi is the same thing as, well, these two switched. xk, xi plus 1. i plus 1. But it's a group, and the group elements have inverses. The inverse of xk is going xk backwards. So you can multiply both sides by xk inverse. So these cancel, giving you that xi equals xi plus 1. So our original group that looked something like x1, x2, down through xn with a whole bunch of relationships, relationship 1 through relationship n, just abelianizes to, well, it's now the group 
x1 through xn, where my relationships are just x1 equals x2, and x2 equals x3, etc. You tracking with that? This is really cool stuff. So, what group is this? If x1 is x2 and x2 is x3, and etc., these are redundant. So you just need a single generator. We'll just call it x. Or, you know, x1 or whatever it is, or x2. They're all the same. And so it's just the group generated by a single x, which is just z. You know, this is just the group of integers. You can have x, x squared, x to the 17, x to the minus 54. That's just z. And so what we're really doing when we calculate linking number, Come back over here, we have this example. We had a specific element, x1 squared, x2, x3 inverse. Let's, let's put it over here. We had some specific element, x1 squared, x2 times x3 inverse. What we're actually doing is we're abelianizing this group. And so then what element does this guy get sent to? Well, all of the x's are the same, so x1 just gets sent to x, so it's x1 squared x2 gets sent to just x, and x3 inverse just gets sent to x inverse. And that gives you just, well, x cubed minus 1, so x squared. Which corresponds to, you know, that corresponds to 1, uh, 2 in, in z. So there's a natural relationship between the fundamental group that just by abelianizing uh, any the, these guys just collapse into the coefficient, the, the, the exponent, which corresponds to some integer, which is the linking number. That is a linking number. Okay, so that's the, that's the group theory perspective on what linking number is. So we've seen four perspectives so far. We saw this first combinatorial one, where you just count the number of what times that the orange passes over the white, and then one component passes over the other. The second one, which is, well, you can count all the crossings over and under, but then you divide by two. The third one is look at ciphered surfaces and see uh, how many times the one link passes through the other one. And then the third one, the fourth one is this group theory perspective, where you look at one component as being a word in the fundamental group of the complement of the other component, and then you see under ubilization what that word gets sent to. And that would be your linking number. So four perspectives, but they're all equivalent. I'm going to give you a fifth perspective now. This one is due to Gauss. I need notes for it. Gauss developed this. So this, this stuff's pretty recent. You know, fundamental group, that's not until the 1900s that we start studying topology and algebraic topology takes off. But Gauss, back in the 1800s, I've already been thinking about this question. And so Gauss thought about using the language of calculus. And the way Gauss thought of it is he said, okay, if you have some link, you know, may maybe it's like a linking between, um, you know, something like this. He said, well, instead of thinking about these as components of the link, we're going to think about them as simple closed curves. And, and those curves have some parameterization. So don't, don't call this k, call it instead like k being some function of, of like s, which, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a parameterized uh, curve, and so this is like some x of s, some y of s, and some z of s. Where, where these are just equations, you know, that map out this curve, where, you know, maybe this is something like, uh, where s is running between some initial value and some, some, some final value, S1. So, you know, as an example of this, you know, like, like here's an example. If I want to do this curve, what might your parameterization be? What might your K of S be? Well, this is just like a unit circle. And so you can imagine, like, if that's a unit circle laying in the XY plane, well, you want to parameterize it, so you want your z values to be zero, and then you can parameterize it by something like cosine of s sine, sine of s, where your s is running between 
0 and 2 pi. Then that's just going to map out this one component. And then Gauss says, you have the component, your j, uh, just think of that as being something parameterized, say, by t, where j is just some, um, uh, I don't want to call it x again, so I'll call it x hat. x hat of t, y hat of t, z hat of t, or z bar of t. And, and your t is you know, running from some initial value to some final value. And then you can be like, okay, so like, like if I want to get this hop link, this guy where the one component's linked to once with the other component, um, how could I do that? Well, now this component is in the, uh, if this is x, y, I guess that's like the, the, the z, z, y plane, right? So that component would be something like j of t. My x values are now fixed at zero. And, um, Okay, I'm tempted to just do like sine and cosine, sine of t, cosine of t, except I need to like, that would be here, and I need to shift it over one, so I need to shift over the y values by one, x is coming out of the board, I need to shift out the y values by one, so it's minus one, I think right there will do the trick. Is it minus one or minus one? Yeah. Just, uh, this is a unit circle, so it has radius one, but diameter two. Okay. So I need to move it over one, right? This should do the trick. You know, these, these are two, and here t is also running from zero to two pi. So, so this is just an example, but, but you know, you can imagine there are equations for all kinds of curves you might make that link together. Then what Gauss found is something called the Gauss integral. Uh, so here's the, the Gauss integral. And, and Gauss discovered that you can find the linking number. Oh, I need plenty of room for this. You can find the linking number between j and k by just calculating an integral, a double integral. So you just integrate. Okay, I'm going to write it down. You do the difference between these x functions. So x bar minus x. Oh, there's no way this is going to fit. That's okay times the derivative of the y times the derivative of z hat minus the derivative of z times the derivative of y hat plus, okay, so this is going to be a long, long integral. It's going to be continued. Plus, dot, 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 plus y hat minus y times z of uh, the derivative of z x hat uh, prime minus x prime z hat prime. So some symmetry here, right? It's like the difference of the y's and these are the guys not involving y's, like the x and the z's, right? So there's some kind of symmetry you can see going on. And so you need the last piece. You have the x's, you have the y's. So the difference between the z's times Oh, okay, we've done, so it should be uh, x, and, x and y, that's right, and yeah, so x prime y bar prime minus y prime x bar prime all over, so this whole thing's over, oh, and, and then we're going to need to, you know, calculate, this is going to be like ds dt, all over the differences between the x's squared, between the differences between the y's, plus the difference between the y squared, plus the differences between the z's squared. So, so this is a, a common thing, some kind of magnitude, all to the three halves. Curl yeah. yeah, yeah, so this, there's a lot here that kind of looks uh, necessary, uh, 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 familiar. And yeah, it is related to some of those other ideas. So like for us, oh. we, we can actually calculate we can calculate the linking number of this. I mean, you could look and you see it's one. But instead, we can calculate a double integral. You want to you wanna do it? Yes. I did it today. It was a lot of fun. I mean, we can do it right now. We can start it at least. It's the double integral where the s and t are both going from 0 to 2 pi. Okay, at least you can reduce it a lot. And then I got to do something I typed into Wolfram Alpha. 
because I'm not very good at integration, but, you know. Anyway, like the differences between your x functions, what is that? Um, well, the differences between my x's is, um, yeah, okay, sure, minus cosine of s times, okay, the, the derivative of the y, so that's cosine times the derivative of the z, which is, which is minus sine, so it's minus cosine sine of t, and then you have a minus the derivative of the z piece, which is, oh, zero, wonderful, look at that, made life better, plus the differences between the y's, so it's sine minus one minus sine, oh, that's just one, uh, uh, minus one, negative one, right? Sine minus one minus sine, so negative one. Oh, dang it, yeah, I can't cancel those, can I? So plus, Sine minus one, minus, I made that mistake this afternoon too, minus sine of s. <laughs> but I went back and I fixed it, because it had to work out. Oh, this isn't the right equation. If you were to do this, you get the answer of four pi. You need to divide by four pi. We need to divide this by four pi. Which, which isn't too surprising, I mean like, like, okay, you can like think about how like, you know, pi, rewinding, it, there's natural connections there, it's not that surprising that shows up. Okay. Where were we? The derivative of the z piece? Uh, well, that's zero, oh, wonderful, that's just zero, minus uh, the derivative of the x piece, so that's minus sine, so it's gonna be plus sine, times the derivative of the z bar piece, which is, minus sine, so that gives minus sine plus the differences between the z's is, oh, it's uh, minus cosine, negative cosine times, oh, okay, this is such a pain. X prime is like minus sine of s y bar prime is cosine of t, am I, am I getting this right? I think that should be plus cosine That's t. Right. x prime is... No, 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 the previous one, I'll take the parentheses. This? Plus cosine t. Well, it was plus, but I think it was minus because the differences between these... Isn't it? Yeah. That's yeah. Because it's, 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 it's um, z bar is cosine t, right? Oh yeah, it's cosine t minus... Comes first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, minus. it's cosine minus zero. Oh, you're totally right, so plus cosine t, right? Okay, uh, plus, I mean, it's just a sign. That doesn't matter in your calculation, right? Um, and then y bar, uh, y prime is, is cosine t, and x bar prime is, oh, great, zero. So that's just zero. That's just zero. All over this guy squared plus this guy squared plus this guy squared. Uh, so that's going to be cosine squared s plus cosine squared t plus this piece squared sine t minus one minus sine s squared all to the three halves ds dt and like you look at this and you do something I mean it's not that bad right like you no know, look at it you get cosine squared s sine t and here you get a, 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 a sine squared s sine t. So those are simplified together. And like a lot of that happens up here. And, and you just do it out, and then you get bored, or you, you get stuck, or you get dumb, and you type it into Wolfram Alpha, and it tells you the answer is 1. Well, you know, this integral is 4 pi, but then you divide it by 4 pi. And so you should do this. It's like good for the soul. Um, this is what they did in the 1800s before they had Netflix, so. <laughs> Anyway, so that's a, that's a fifth perspective on linking number.